It's been only 250 years since people began organizing each other, devising systems and inventing equipment for saving homes and businesses from the devastation of fire. Fire engines have stood on the front lines in this constant battle with fire. The struggle pits fire against brave firefighters and their amazing machines. Fire engines. It wasn't until the late 18th century that people finally began to discover ways to battle the scourge of fire. Some tried using brick to lessen the danger, but the close proximity of homes and businesses meant any spark would soon spread. Homes and businesses were still vulnerable. Wood was still used for framing, and wooden shingles were fashionable. A spark from a chimney could set a home ablaze. People nailed ladders to their roofs so they could hold on while they tried to stomp out the flames. This was not only difficult on a steeply pitched, slippery, moss-covered roof, it was dangerous. Because homes were so close together, a fire at one would likely soon spread. Since they had no community patrols, alarm systems, or firefighting equipment, fires spread easily. Almost every major community, whether it be uh, Jamestown, Boston, New York, uh, in colonial times had a major fire. And part of the problem here was the fact that the structures were very close together. And so once one started on fire, the embers would go to the thatched roof of another one. Fires were common and the results were often devastating. Yet it took years for firefighting to evolve. They would uh, pull buildings down in the path of the fire uh, and sometimes even blow them up with gunpowder or black powder to prevent the spread of fire. And that was about what they were limited to. People recognized that they needed a system to fight fires. They started bucket brigades. While not very efficient, bucket brigades were the first step toward creating a modern, organized firefighting operation. At first, each home had its own fire buckets, marked with the name or initials of the owner and a number. Later, many were illustrated with crests, portraits, and insignia. The need kept leather workers busy, but no matter how many they made, it was never enough. Something better had to be invented. In 1721, an English button maker named Richard Newsham received a royal patent for a firefighting machine he said would be the most useful and convenient engines for quenching fires. Newsom's engines became known as hand tubs. They were mobile troughs pulled to a fire by the bucket brigades who would fill them using their buckets. The tubs held 170 gallons of water. What really set them apart were the two mechanical pumps. The way Richard Newsham designed his fire engine, and this was what made it the great technological leap forward that it was, is that when one piston goes up in one cylinder, that partial vacuum that it creates draws water into that cylinder through a one-way leather flap valve. Now, at the same time, when that one piston is rising and drawing the water in underneath or into the cylinder, the corresponding uh, piston in the opposite cylinder is going down, forcing the water out of the cylinder and into the pressure tank. This gave the Newshams a range of 70 feet an important breakthrough, homes were saved. Well, what we have found with our Newsham 
is that we can empty that 150 gallon cistern in about two minutes flat. So you're throwing about 75 gallons, maybe if there was a real fire with adrenaline, maybe closer to 100 gallons a minute at a fire. That's an effective amount of water going toward a fire. Pumping was hard work. The crew was worn out in eight to 10 minutes and had to be changed. Soon, larger, more powerful and efficient hand pumpers were built. These gave rise to volunteer groups of firefighters that were known as mutual aid societies. This was the start of modern firefighting. Belonging to one of these new self-governing independent groups became prestigious. The groups attracted new members by displaying lavishly decorated engines. Commonly, they were decorated with paintings of notables like George Washington, who was a member of Alexandria, Virginia's volunteer fire company. Members had to donate one or two fire buckets to gain admission to the club or company. Eventually, the buckets were taken to fires on a separate truck. Some of the wealthier groups bought other specialized equipment. There was a rush to develop better tools and improve firefighting equipment. The result? Extension ladders for high buildings, longer hoses, and special trucks for them. These tools became, and still are, the basic equipment used to fight fires. Inventors also created more powerful pumps that could bring water from farther away and throw more water deeper into a fire. It could demand two dozen men to operate a large hand pumper and the same number to pull all the equipment carts. Technology was advancing, but the volunteer associations were becoming a problem. They were often boisterous, rowdy drinking clubs that resisted change. The equipment was getting bigger and difficult to pull. Horses could be used to pull the gear to a fire, but the fire companies fought this because horses would displace dues-paying members. The firehouse gangs often wildly raced each other to fires through city streets. Some of the decent volunteers were being pushed out by rowdy drinking louts who were linked to local political machines. Inside the firehouse, it was heavily laden with politics. If you had a large engine, for example, you'd need 20 guys to man the brakes or to run the engine. And they'd only be good for three or five minutes, and then you'd need another team of 20 to come in, and maybe a third team of 20. And if you were the, the chief, over many, many of these fire brigades, then you had a, maybe a thousand man force. And some of these guys were picked not only for their expertise at fight and fire, but their expertise at stuff in the ballot box. The cronyism of the barroom clubs couldn't hold back progress forever. The steam engine led the way to a revolution in firefighting. Fire engine collectors loved to tinker with these old steamers, but the firehouse clubs in the United States saw them as the enemy. They knew their power would go up in flames. The first steam pumpers were invented in England in the late 1820s. Resistance there wasn't as bad. They were first tested at a London fire in 1830. Their boilers pumped water for five hours. The assorted hand-operated carts had exhausted all the firemen, but the steam engines kept working. However, the steam-powered fire pumpers met fierce resistance when brought to New York in 1840. Firefighters still thought any new technology would put them out of a job. They knew one of these could do the work of many men. Their political patrons feared losing the organized support of the firefighters. Politicians blocked steam pumpers coming to firehouses across the country until 1851. That's when a fire in Cincinnati got out of control because drunken rival firehouses started to fight each other instead of the fire. 
And that eventually was one of the reasons that led to the demise of the volunteer fire department is that certain uh, elements were uncontrollable and the insurance companies uh, and the government of the city couldn't stand for it anymore, so they began to take action. The Cincinnati City Council tossed out the entire firefighting system. The council established the first paid firefighting force in the country. Change couldn't be stopped. The council developed rules of conduct and hoped they would eliminate the clubhouse brawlers by employing a smaller fire force and buying steam engines. Slowly, cities around the Midwest and in the East began adopting steam engines. New York was a holdout. The political czar, Boss Tweed, who was the fire captain and all-powerful city hall operator, wouldn't allow it. Tweed ran the city without being mayor. The firehouses were an important part of his base. He wasn't about to give this up. But while his political machine was strong, even corrupt politicians have to listen to disgruntled voters. Eventually, New York's Tammany Hall succumbed to the steam engine. The horse-drawn steamers built by Aaron's Fox, La France, Clapp, and Silsby became common fixtures as they went racing through the streets of New York. The steam engine was the rage. Initially, steamers were pulled by people, but eventually were converted for horses. This Clapham Jones steamer, built in 1870, was originally pulled by 30 to 40 men. Its rope reels were replaced. A wrought iron and wooden seat was installed for a driver, and harnesses attached for horses. The La France Fire Engine Company and others began building horse-drawn steamers. This 1882 steamer is equipped with pole and shafts for either a two or three horse rig. Its wheels were indented to allow it to ride on the trolley tracks. It was owned by the Buffalo, New York Fire Department, then was sold to Gowanda, New York in 1920 and was in service until 1940. The volunteer fire system was being replaced by city-paid firemen. The rowdy reputation of the firefighters began to fade as technology improved. Steam-powered pumpers were clearly more effective, and the days of the bad boys were over. Every little boy now longed to be a firefighter. Everyone fell in love with these heroes. In those days, there wasn't much entertainment. If a building went on fire, it was great fun for everyone, and every, the populace would turn out to watch the fire. This transition from rogue to hero made the firefighters popular. Suddenly, they were asked to lead parades and take part in community celebrations. Prompted by their new status, many fire companies bought expensive vehicles used only in parades, like this 11-foot-high hose carriage from the 1890s. It's finished in etched mirrors and supported on each side by two large silver-plated lions. A fireman holding a child stands guard over the reel. Two spring-mounted bells rang as its 68-inch wheels rolled down the streets. It was a crowd-pleaser. Then came the movies. Thomas Edison invented the motion picture camera and made a tidy fortune providing short documentaries to small theaters or Nickelodeons. Fire was always a popular subject. Edison didn't believe that people would sit through a film if it ran longer than a minute. His cameraman, William S. Porter, told him they would. Edison wouldn't listen, so Porter made an eight-minute fictional film about a fire and rescue. The public ate it up. Theaters around the world were screening the life of a fireman. People had been conditioned by exciting newspaper accounts to embrace firefighters and couldn't get enough. In New York, one firefighter, Seneca Locke, stirred the public's imagination. On January 9th, 1912, 
A call went out about a fire at the Equitable Insurance Building in Manhattan. It housed stores, a restaurant, a lawyer's club, and a bank. The weather was bitter cold that day. A sharp wind blew, and ice began to form on the fire equipment and the building. The bank president and his colleagues were trapped in the basement. They called a fireman through an iron-barred window. Seneca Lark started to hack through the bars. A breathless crowd watched as Lark lay on his stomach and began to soar. Water from the fire hoses quickly soaked him and turned his body into an ice sculpture. When his arm froze, another fireman used a hammer to break the ice off Lark's fire coat while he kept sawing away. After an hour, the steel bars finally gave. Two of the trapped men crawled out through the open window. A third man was dead, but Lark was a hero. Postcards depicting the rescue of the fire became popular on the newsstands. The lesson the New York City Fire Department learned at the Equitable Fire was that it needed better equipment, such as acetylene torches, breathing masks, and grappling hooks to make faster rescues. This resulted in the creation of Rescue One, which is today the most elite civilian rescue service in the United States. The rescue company was an immediate success. By the late 1800s, steam technology was finally harnessed to create self-propelled fire trucks. These steam engines didn't need to be fed, reshoed, or have their stables shoveled out. But there were problems. You have to remember a steam fire engine has to carry its own water source. And the propulsion side of the steam fire business was not as good as the making of steam for the fire pump. In other words, the thing would go 12 miles an hour as fast as a horse team. But if it had to go more than two or three miles, it might run out of its own water source before it got to the hydrant. And so many of these things were actually converted to horse-drawn later on. As technology advanced, steam and horsepower gave way to a new invention, the gasoline engine. One of the new machines was the Watrous fire engine, which was drawn by horses but pumped using a gasoline-powered engine. The move to gasoline engines came slowly. The noted manufacturers of steam power, Aaron's Fox, Seagrave, American La France and Latter, all knew that gasoline was the energy wave of the future. They began to build gasoline-powered tractors to pull the pumpers. At the same time, they started working on gasoline-powered pumps to replace the steamers. By 1915, gasoline power was common. Three fire engine manufacturers, Aaron's Fox, Seagraves and American La France, dominated fire truck manufacturing for the next 50 years. Ford and some other companies supplied just the chassis to be used to build fire trucks. A Model T based fire engine was perfect for small towns, but not for a big city. Each of the main company's engines stood out. In 1913, Charles Fox of the Aaron's Fox Company developed a distinctive series of centrifugal pumps on the front of his fire truck, ahead of the engine. So they had a piston pump and they had it mounted in front of the truck. Uh, Seagrave, they mounted their pump in the back. And then American La France uh, took a, a gear style pump from a steam fire engine and mounted it in the middle of the frame. So if you parked all three of them next to each other, you would have one with the pump in the front, one with the pump in the middle, and the other with the pump in the rear. The public continued to love its fire trucks and heroes, especially during the depths of the Depression, when crowds would come out to special shows that featured the New York Fire Department at Madison Square Garden. The crowds were growing, but the Depression shrank fire department's budgets. The cost of developing larger and bigger pumps and building the trucks was astronomical. Many cities put off buying new equipment, and some manufacturers almost went under.
When war broke out in Europe in 1939, Hitler's bombs rained on London and fires spread out of control. American fire engine manufacturers were called on to help the British. Even before American war machinery started arriving in England under the Lend-Lease program, American fire truck companies were sending pumpers to battle the effects of the Luftwaffe's bombs. When the United States entered the war in late 1941, all auto manufacturing switched to making war machines. One fire truck maker, Seagrave, was exempted. They were essential for the defense of the home front. The wartime experiences introduced several changes and upgrades in firefighting. Chemical foams and high-pressure fog mists were invented to rain down on a fire. When the war was over, prosperity flourished and the returning soldiers began buying homes and settling the suburbs. These new suburbs needed new fire departments and fire trucks. But not all the manufacturers would survive. Orange Fox struggled to hang on. In 1950, the company built what many consider its greatest truck. A pumper that was sleek and low slung. It was enhanced with a rag top that gave it a sporty look. This would be one of the last great designs from Aaron's Fox. In 1951, the name was sold and its assembly line closed. It was the end of a glorious era of great looking machines. But even as companies like Aaron's Fox vanished, Americans stormed into a new way of life. Skyscrapers, malls, tract housing, all of which created new problems for firefighters, whether in the cities or the suburbs. Hazardous material transportation and chemical spills became a priority. The nightmare of how to respond to a blazing high-rise became a major dilemma for fire chiefs. Fighting large municipal fires required real skill and knowledge to coordinate huge teams. Rescue operations, police support, and an army of firefighters had to synchronize. But the charm of the fire engines from the early 1920s to the late 1950s began to disappear in the 1960s. The new engines were capable, but to some, they were soulless. These new fire engines were powerful machines propelled by fuel-efficient diesel engines that could keep pumping for hours and required less attention and maintenance. While these engines made firefighting better, some began to long for the days of the beautifully decorated machines of another era. The modern fire engine just didn't have the charm or allure of earlier fire engines. I really think the golden age of the fire engine probably started sometime in the 20s and on up through the 60s. Uh, and what made it the golden age was the fact that from a block away you could tell what brand it was as it came around the corner. Each was distinctive in its appearance. Each was distinctive in its pump style. And they were beautiful pieces of equipment. No matter when a fire engine was made, it was created to help the community. For over 250 years, these engines have been racing to fires, putting them out, and saving lives. No wonder everyone feels comforted when one passes by. I really believe that the fire engine probably rivals the Red Cross as, as man's symbol to kindness to his fellow man. No matter where you are, or what trouble you're in, if they tell you the fire truck's just around the corner, the firemen are gonna be here soon to assist you. It's a very calming effect. These symbols of kindness are also workhorses that have made our world a safer and better place to be. It's hard to imagine what life would be like without the protection of the fire engine.